American government, public opinion. Public opinion is the holy grail of democratic politics. It's impossible to ignore public opinion, but at the same time, it's hard to pin it down. What's going on in the minds of the people? How are they thinking about the problems facing the country or their state or their local community? Do they have opinions on foreign affairs and the effects of monetary inflation on their standard of living? The answer is probably yes, but the same people are generally more focused on getting home from work and putting dinner on the table. As the journalist Walter Lippmann put it, quote, we are concerned in public affairs, but immersed in our private ones. That's a problem for democratic theory. Theoretically, government is a democratic system that rests on the will of the people. But that assumes the will of the people is informed, clear, and engaged, and that people are interested in politics. And so that's one of the puzzles of democratic politics. Where does public opinion fit into the equation? How attentive to public opinion should the government be? How attentive to public opinion is the government? What happens if and when agents of the government believe it is best to actually ignore public opinion? Expansion of democracy, global democratic movements have led political theorists to ask what is meant by the phrase, the will of the people, the people want. Did that mean officials had to pay heed to people's everyday opinions? Edmund Burke, an influential 18th century Irish-born thinker, argued no. He believed that citizens were ill-equipped to make policy judgments and that representatives should decide what was best for them. Said Burke, your representative owes you his judgment and he betrays you if he sacrifices it to your opinion. Burke's line of thinking was cemented into the very foundations of our Republican government. Burke's contemporary, English thinker uh, Jeremy Bentham, thought differently than Burke. Bentham argued for utilitarian theory. Bentham utilitarian theory. The idea that citizens deserve to be heard, indeed, that public opinion was the best protection against misrule by government. That view, that people's everyday opinions mattered more than careful judgment by their representatives, has come into more and more vogue here in the 21st century. But a practical question remains. How is public opinion to be divined or determined? Was it to be judged by what was being said from the church pulpit in the, in, in the community hall, by what newspaper reporters were hearing on the streets, by studying election results? The introduction of scientific polling, beginning roughly in the 1930s, more or less settled the question of how public opinion was to be measured. Polls, surveys, gained early and instant credibility when the first ever Gallup presidential poll accurately predicted a landslide victory for Franklin D. Roosevelt over Alf Landon in 1936. Many newspapers had predicted otherwise, newspapers that were talking to the people. They had reported for months that voters couldn't wait to get rid of Roosevelt. As it turned out, newspaper publishers were living in an echo chamber, as they did in 2016 with the election of Donald Trump. They and their high-earning friends despised the implications of Roosevelt's New Deal and had only been listening really to each other. Polls are now the dominant method of gauging and researching public opinion. But they have issues too. In a poll, a small number of carefully selected individuals, or as they're called, the sample, those who take the poll, are used to estimate the opinions of an entire population or group, such as the residents of a city or country. How is that possible? How can brief interviews, say, with a thousand respondents, possibly provide a reliable estimate of what millions of Americans are thinking? The answer is found in the laws, mathematical laws of probability. Consider the hypothetical example of a huge jar filled with a million marbles, all of them various shades of red and blue, representing different political perspectives on the political right and political left. If 1,000 marbles are chosen randomly and sampled, laws of probability teach us that we likely have a representative sample that very closely approximates, not perfectly, but approximates the composition of the entire million marble bowl. Even 100 marbles, while not quite as accurate, might give us a very good idea of the composition of the giant bowl. Opinion sampling works on the same principle. If enough respondents are selected at random, it can be used to estimate what a larger population as a whole thinks, understands, or believes. It wouldn't much matter whether the jar held a million, 10 million, or 100 million marbles. The size of the sample would matter, however. If you, if you tried to generalize about a million marbles from a sample of just 10, you'd stand a stronger chance of drawing incorrect conclusions. On the other hand, if you drew a thousand marbles from the jar, the odds greatly improve that the sample distribution will come closer to the actual number. Never perfectly, but pretty close. The accuracy of a poll is expressed in terms of sampling error, which can be mathematically figured as well, sampling error. This error occurs because a relatively small sample is being used to estimate the characteristics, a 
of the full population. The error refers to the difference between the estimate obtained from the sample and what the actual figure would be if the entire population had been contacted and sampled. As you would expect, the larger the sample, the smaller the sampling error. The more people of the million, or 10 million, or 100 million you can talk to, the more accurate you're going to be. In other words, the more people surveyed, the less likely the poll will be inaccurate. Most public opinion polls are based on samples between 400 and 1,500 respondents. A properly drawn random sample of, say, 1,200 respondents has a sampling error of rough, uh, roughly plus or minus 3%. Thus, if 55% of those polled say they intend to vote for the Republican presidential candidate, it's highly likely that somewhere between 52 and 58%, that's the 55%, plus or minus 3% sampling error of the total population that tends to vote for the Republican candidate among the total population. Polls can go wrong for a lot of reasons. Poorly worded or slanted questions, for example, can confuse or mislead respondents. As well, pollsters can only approximate random selection in choosing their respondents. Most polls, for example, are conducted by telephone. In this case, pollsters are sampling telephone numbers rather than people directly. Nevertheless, reputable polling firms have a solid track record. The Gallup Poll Organization, for example, has polled every presidential election since 1936. On average, the final Gallup Poll's election prediction comes within two percentage points of the actual result. Now, pollsters ask Americans a great many things. Their feelings about the president, their party identification, their opinions on issues, their religious affiliation, and so on. Here, we'll concentrate on policy opinions, focusing on three of their attributes. Direction, intensity, and salience. Opinions have direction. That is, people can favor or oppose a policy. The 2014 Washington Post ABC News poll, for example, asked respondents whether undocumented immigrants living within the United States should or should not be given the right to live and work legally. 46% said they should. 50% said they should not. When, as in this case, the polling group is divided in its opinions, the issue is likely to be a source of partisan conflict. On the other hand, when opinions are one-sided, conflict is usually limited. After the terror attacks of September 11, 2001, the public was largely of one mind on the issue of taking the war to the terrorists in Afghanistan. There was relatively little debate over whether or not to invade that country. When polled at the time of the invasion whether it was the right thing to do, 89% of Americans said that it was. Only 9% felt the invasion would be a mistake. Now, intensity is another opinion attribute. Intensity is a question of how strongly people feel about a specific issue. During the 2012 presidential campaign, for example, a Pew Research Center poll asked respondents how important the abortion issue was to their vote. Very important, somewhat important, or not at all important. The intensity level was much higher for those on the anti-abortion side on the issue. Compared to those who believed abortion should be legal in all circumstances, those who felt it should be illegal in all circumstances were more than twice as likely to say that the issue was very important to their choice of a presidential candidate. Intense opinions tend to get lawmakers' attention. Intensity is a sign that people might act on what they believe, i.e., they might actually show up to vote, they might show, uh, donate to a campaign, or even volunteer on behalf of a campaign. This uh, example illustrates why parties and candidates find and pay for so much polling data. Opinions also have salience, which refers to the importance of an issue relative to other issues. How relevant and salient is it? Salience is related to intensity. The more strongly people feel about an issue, the more likely they are to think that it's important. But intensity and salience are not the same thing. For example, people might have an intense opinion about genetically modified food, or GMOs, but not see it as a salient issue. It could be far down on their list of important issues. They might feel strongly about it, but it might still not matter that much to them. In polls, issue salience is often measured by asking respondents what they regard as the country's most important problem. Pocket book issues. The economy, jobs, wages typically are at the top of the list. Virtually no one in polls mentions genetically modified food as being their number one issue. An issue salience matters to elected officials. They don't risk much by neglecting low salience issues like genetically modified food, but they can get themselves in trouble by ignoring the highly salient ones. What's the unemployment rate? Some analysts, for example, have concluded that Barack Obama made a very strategic mistake in pursuing health care reform in the first months of his presidency, a time when the economy was the number one issue on American minds. Obama paid for his decision to pursue that issue in the 2010 midterm elections when Democrats lost control of the House of Representatives and saw their Senate majority dwindle. 
Exit polls indicated that a majority of voters were upset with Obama's handling of health care and the economy, even though he had made health care such a priority. Obama's strategy was a sharp contrast with that of Democratic President FDR, who took office during the height of the Great Depression. After inauguration, Roosevelt concentrated on getting more Americans back to work and stayed on that issue for three full years. Only then did he ask Congress to enact Social Security, one of his pet programs. In both the 1932 midterm and 1936 presidential elections, Democrats increased the size of their House and Senate majorities in comparison. Another quirk of polling is that people are often unpredictable, and so is polling methodology. Until fairly recently, much of the American polling focused on calling existing landline phone numbers. You might not even know what a landline phone is. Cell phone call lists were less available and more expensive to access. It's tended to skew some polling for many years toward those citizens who still had a landline phone physically plugged into their home, which is not a particularly representative group of people and has been less so over time. In addition, phone calls only reach those willing to pick the phone up and answer political questions from a perfect stranger. Also, sometimes people just lie, and they, as they famously did in the presidential election of 2016, telling someone you were planning to vote for Donald Trump both in 2016 and in 2020, invited intense criticism from many people. It became clear after the 2016 election that methods used by pollsters to measure public opinion before the election failed to take into account the private Donald Trump voters, those who thought it best to simply lie about who they planned to vote for in order to avoid criticism and arguments with their friends, family, coworkers, and people randomly calling them. Let's look at the interplay of these three opinion attributes through the lens of a single policy issue, gun control. America has a lot of guns. There are more privately held firearms in the United States than there are people living in the United States. That's the highest ratio in the world. Canada and all of its hunters have a ratio of half of ours. France has one gun for every three people. England has one for every 16. There are a lot of hunters in the United States, 10 million or so, as well as uh, the uncounted number of skeet, trap, and target shooters. The uh, United States also has a lot of gun deaths, about 45,000 per year. Roughly one-third of those deaths are the result of intentional homicides. The rest, two-thirds, are suicides or accidental shooting deaths. Now, given the high number of gun deaths, it's not surprising that over the years, attempts have been made to regulate gun ownership in the United States. The first major federal laws enacted in, were in the 1930s, and they limited the sale of machine guns, a favorite of organized crime during the period of alcohol prohibition. In the early 1960s, the sale of guns to felons and the mentally ill was restricted. In the 1990s, Congress expanded background checks and waiting period requirements for handguns and military-style rifles. The so-called Assault Weapons Ban, signed by President Bill Clinton in 1994, had a sunset provision. The sun would set on it. The law would expire in 2004 unless renewed by Congress. When the Assault Weapons Ban came up for renewal in 2004, Congress declined to extend the ban. Later, Congress passed a law protecting gun sellers and manufacturers from being sued if their product was involved in a shooting. In 2008, the Supreme Court cited the Second Amendment in D.C. versus Heller decision, Supreme Court decision, overturned certain municipal restrictions on handgun ownership and possession that had popped up in some of America's biggest cities. In 2013, shortly after the Sandy Hook Elementary School massacre tragedy, Advocates of gun control in Congress made concerted efforts to once again tighten federal regulations on personal gun ownership. Barack Obama dropped nearly all of his domestic policy efforts after that shooting to focus on the issue. After just a few weeks, failing to gain traction on the issue, they abandoned it once again. So where does public opinion fit into this picture? What part has it played in what's happened since the 1990s? Let's look first to the direction of public opinion, where Americans actually stand on gun control. Americans are split on the issue. A larger number of Americans generally, and at times, some, sometimes twice as many, have told pollsters that they wanted stricter controls on gun purchases instead of fewer. So if we were considering only pro and con opinions, we might have expected lawmakers to place additional restrictions on guns rather than fewer, which has been the case since 94. So let's look at opinion intensity to see if that helps us understand what's happened here. And here we begin to get our answer. Gun control opponents, those supporting firearm ownership, are far more willing to act on their opinions. They're twice as likely as those favoring more gun control to have written a public a policy official or given money in support of their position. Now let's add opinion salience to the mix. For starters, gun violence is not a particularly salient issue. In most Gallup polls of the past two decades, 1% or fewer of respondents have named gun violence as the nation's biggest problem. That would suggest that lawmakers can safely ignore the issue, knowing that only a small number of people see it as a pressing problem. 
On the other hand, gun violence has sometimes become more salient, sometimes quickly. In May of 1999, for example, shortly after the Columbine High School massacre in Colorado, 10% of Gallup poll respondents suddenly cited gun violence as their top issue. More recently, gun violence has pulled closer to 2%. Mass shootings get intense media coverage, briefly reshaping public opinion, and provide gun control advocates what looks like a window of opportunity to push for stricter gun control laws. After the shooting at Sandy Hook School, for example, President Obama set aside other issues to put pressure on Congress to act immediately. Yet, as you all understand, legislation in the United States must work its way through a federal system of divided powers, where partisan differences can stop action from happening. In essence, a Republican system of government actually works to prevent rapid decision-making in response to fleeting shifts in public opinion. Democrats are heavily in favor of banning so-called assault weapons, while only a minority of Republicans favor doing so. When the bill to permanently ban the sale of these military-style weapons, semi-automatics, was considered in Congress in 2013, it did not come up for a vote in the Republican-controlled House. It was blocked before it reached the floor. In the Democratic-controlled Senate, there was a vote, but the ban was defeated 60 to 40. Every Senate Republican but one voted against the ban, and they were joined by 15 Democrats. Some may find that surprising. But these Democrats were from rural states where hunting and gun ownership is a cultural tradition and where intensity for gun ownership is also high. Rural America ranks gun ownership rights ahead of gun control, while the opposite of, is true of urban America. The benefits and costs of federal policy action can either be concentrated, targeted at a specific interest, or diffused, spread across society. The issue of gun control clearly fits best in the diffuse benefits, concentrated costs category that politicians are generally reluctant to even pay attention to. The benefits of gun control are diffuse because they're hard to pinpoint. You can't point to a shooting that didn't happen because someone's right to own a gun was restricted. The American people intuitively understand that fewer people will commit suicide, be killed, or be injured if guns are more tightly regulated. But it's impossible to know who those people are. And since the odds of being a gun victim are small in the first place, few individuals will think gun control will make them measurably safer. On the other hand, the costs of gun control are concentrated. They restrict the options of gun owners and Second Amendment supporters of persistently large and involved voting bloc in American politics. Thus, those opposed to additional firearm regulations will likely feel the impact of stricter laws personally. The distribution of the costs and benefits of gun control helps explain why intensity is so much higher on one side of the issue than the other. It also explains why lawmakers from certain states and districts shy away from the issue whenever possible. Citizens who, citizens who oppose new gun regulations are more likely to cast their ballot based on the issue than those who favor additional gun regulations. Even those who would like to see gun ownership restricted in some way understand they are unlikely to do so, given the plain language of the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution. Supreme Court rulings like D.C. v. Heller have recently identified the personal ownership of firearms as a fundamental right rooted in fundamental American values, the individual preservation of life and property present since America's colonial days. In short, and in sum, polling has limits Poll a random selection of Americans after a terrible shooting, and maybe a clear majority will tell you they'd like to see more federal gun control measures in place. But the lack of intensity and salience of the issue for that group means such polls are often misleading. Polls do not make policy, and nor should they. I've just explained the attributes of opinion and how they affect the play of politics. As yet unaddressed is the most basic question about public opinion, however. How much influence does it have on the functions of our government? What's the magnitude and what are the limits of public opinion? Policy decisions made at the federal level are rarely the result of a single influence. Lobbying, partisanship, media coverage, global events, and finally public opinion. All these and more can play into the writing of a piece of legislation. In addition, we must remember that public opinion has contradictory elements to it. People's opinions always don't line up in a logical way. For instance, a majority of Americans routinely tell pollsters they favor a significant cut to federal income tax rates. But many in the same group will also tell pollsters they support expanded government services and programs, particularly programs they personally benefit from, Social Security, Medicare, the Military Veterans Affairs, Food Assistance Benefits, etc. You cannot actually have your cake and eat it too, but you can certainly tell a polling agency that's what you want. Considerable research has been done on the impact of public opinion, and the findings support some clear conclusions. One is that public opinion constrains officials. Public opinion limits their choices. Officials must operate within the boundaries of what the public will find acceptable and unacceptable. 
An example is the Social Security program of old age benefits that everyone is compelled to pay into, which has such broad public support that it's sometimes been called the third rail of American politics, a metaphor for a policy that's likely to hurt any politician that tries to touch it like the electrified rail on a subway line. Over the years, a few have tried. In 2005, for example, President George W. Bush proposed privatizing part of the Social Security program. Like others before him, the public response was so strongly negative that Bush had to back down. During his 2016 presidential campaign, Donald Trump vowed to cut federal domestic spending and promised that every domestic spending program would be subject to review. Yet when Trump proposed his first set of budget cuts as president, Social Security was not on that list. The president who signed the Social Security into life, President Franklin Roosevelt, predicted that people would forever fight tooth and nail to protect the retirement benefits they had earned through paying payroll taxes during their working years. Said Roosevelt, no damn politician can ever scrap my Social Security program, which he mimicked on uh, German programs. So far, he's been right. Even though long-simmering economic and demographic challenges today threaten its foundational precepts, Social Security is a Ponzi scheme that relies on a growing American workforce to power it. On the other hand, there's a wide range of policy decisions, most of them, in fact, where public opinion does not come into play. In short, most policy decisions take place far outside the public eye. In the area of foreign affairs, for example, there are hundreds of policies in which the public is not remotely aware. Rules regarding the dispersion of foreign aid to Yemen, safety standard agreements with the European Union, special tariffs on wines from South America, the list would be virtually endless. Most domestic policy decisions also take place outside of public view. How many Americans know or care, for example, that the federal government has, very recently, spent nearly $2 million working to improve the taste of tomatoes, investigate reports of UFOs over Alaska, and to develop a video game about climate change. Policies such as these, rather than being decided in the context of public opinion, are decided largely through the interest group system, which is the subject of another talk here. But the point is, very few people pay attention to the myriad functions of the federal government precisely because it has grown so expansive and large deficits have become our unfortunate norm. Million dollar programs are no longer large enough to warrant the attention of the general public. The American public, frankly, doesn't want to form opinions on what much of the federal government today does. Now, what about those issues that do catch the public's attention, those that get a lot of attention from the media and attract wide public interest? Are officials responsive to public opinion in these cases? A number of studies have looked closely at that question. They've examined trends in policy and opinion over time, seeking to determine whether changes in public opinion are followed by corresponding changes in actual public policy. These studies have overwhelmingly found that when public opinion changes, so in most cases does U.S. policy. In other words, direction, intensity, and salience really do matter. Studies have shown that when public opinion is intense and unmistakable as to a preferred course of action, politicians nearly always follow it, as it will help them get reelected. Now, such findings should not be taken to mean that officials blindly follow public opinion or should. At times, public opinion somewhat trails policy as opposed to leading it. This can be particularly striking with Supreme Court decisions, i.e. Brown versus Board of Education, which struck down a separate but equal doctrine of school segregation, or even Obergefell versus Hodges just a few years ago, which restricted states from being able to deny marriage licenses to same-sex couples. So-called hot-button issues can suddenly be settled by a legal policy, even when the political winds are still blowing strongly, hence the pushback across the South in response to forced school desegregation. Moreover, politicians have room to maneuver, even when they're responding to public opinion. For example, though Republican and Democratic lawmakers alike are responsive to public demands for public policy action during times of economic distress, they have different approaches to improving the economy. Widespread agreement in principle on the intensity and salience of a problem, say, improving resources for homeless veterans, does not mean that there will be any agreement at all on what shape an effective policy solution should take. Nevertheless, decades of research demonstrate that federal policy on high-profile policy issues usually moves in the direction of public opinion toward public opinion. And as voters, you should take care to understand this. Public opinion influences policy. As such, efforts to drive and influence public opinion are often made in the hopes of influencing policy in the future. There's a war for your mind. Earlier, for instance, we explored public opinion and the gun control issue in some detail. In fact, efforts by gun control advocates to focus on mass shootings in campaign ads, in congressional investigations, in the media, etc., can be understood as a long-term effort to increase the intensity and salience of this issue among non-gun owners. Not all politics is short-term focused, especially for the parties themselves. 
The Democratic Party, more than any single politician now running for office, knows that public opinion can change, and it hopes that greater gun control efforts will one day become politically expedient instead of a political non-starter at some point in the future. And so the party and its members draw attention to the issue at every opportunity despite the lack of a clear pathway to actual legislative action. And this is why politicians will continue to beat the drum on issues that even they know are going nowhere in a given Congress. In short, they write gun control laws they know won't pass in the hopes of influence American minds in the future. In the same way, Republicans hope to eventually turn the American public against expansive abortion rights. And so they fight political battles today they know that they will lose in the hopes of winning the larger war for public opinion in the future. As the expression goes, it's all politics.